about a year ago, an idea popped into my mind to create which what some of you guys might know as the Big Dog Bash or our BDG3 project, which was our NFT project that we launched earlier this summer. We basically sold 600 BDG3 passes, accumulating a USD value dollar of, I wanna say between 105 and $110,000 based off ETH prices at the time of the mint day or the purchase day. And I wanna bring it all the way back to the start. In this video, I want to talk about all of the things that I have learned from that day in which the idea popped into my mind all the way through right now as the project for year one has basically concluded. We still have other things in the works for the BDG3 members. As of right now, the football season is done. So the first fantasy football tournament, which was a big lever in terms of getting people into it from a marketing perspective, has wrapped up as the fantasy football season had wrapped up. So today's video is going to be talking through our NFT project, why we got into it, and the things that we've learned. Both the good, the bad, and the fugly, otherwise known as the fucking ugly, because this project had its ups and downs. And that's probably an understatement. So I wanna introduce it to y'all. If you are new to it, I want to take you through the storyline that was how this thing played out. And I think I purchased my first real NFT the April before that. So we're taking it, we're taking it bike a step. November of 2021 is when I first had the idea pop into my mind to do BDG3 and do the Big Dog Bash. April, I believe of that year, whenever Gary V minted his first V Friends, Series 1, I was there on Mint Day. That was like my first real purchase in the NFT world. So as you can see, I'm a great fucking investor. That box right there, that lime green box down there, you don't get that unless you're a V Friend holder. Point was, as I was learning more and more about the space and I had people that I admired and looked up to and creators that I had been following getting into the space, it drew me in. It drew me in to to understand what the technology was. Why are people getting into the space? What is the practical use of NFTs? Non-fungible tokens. Most y'all out there will continue to say that NFTs are like a scam. And I believe, and, and I, I side with you for the most part, but if you listen to what I'm going to say over the next, you know, I don't know how long it's gonna go on, 15, 20, knowing me, 48 minutes, I think you'll understand where I'm coming from, why we launched the project, and why I still believe that NFTs are the future of most technological things. So as I dug in more and more, I started to understand the technology. And I, I, I think the biggest driving point for me was one, everything is receipt based. Like there's no way to forge the way uh, or the, the purchase that you made. So no matter if, if entities are in project form or if they're in purchasing form, if they are in product form, like you buy something from a trader, brand or company, that will always be trackable on the blockchain. And as new technology develops and NFTs are used, not in like a pro, everyone thinks of NFTs as, as like a product that you make and then sell it to somebody. But this technology, the blockchain technology is gonna be used within businesses and corporations over the next five, 10 years as new ways of using it expand and everything will be trackable. Every move, every transaction will be trackable. It does, isn't that, doesn't always have to be like company or product based. People only know about it because they, they hear of these art sales and they hear of these crazy sales that happen in the NFT space. Um, but I, I truly believe in the fact that like in 10 years when everything is tractable, tractable and transactional, that will be such a, a, a cool piece of technology that will enable a lot of companies to get to a new level. Um, I won't spend all my time talking about what NFTs are. The other thing that drew me in was the fact that it will always tie us to, because everything is trackable and traceable, we know exactly who holds our NFTs. So we can always airdrop them things, give them things, and have a way that proves that, hey, we're holding this event, we are dropping this product, we are doing this X, Y, and Z. Only Series 1 BDG3 holders are allowed to purchase this or come to this event or be part of this. And we know exactly who has them because the blockchain is non fuckwittable so i believe really really wholeheartedly in the technology the deeper i got into it and i was like man i want to make an nft for our brand for our audience something that you guys can hopefully be introduced to the space because it's something i'm passionate about i want to right that, that's our brand has always been about that our brand has always been about promoting things that we're internally passionate about right big dogs gotta eat big dogs are the people that are willing to put themselves out there and be passionate about things and chase after things the people that do that are going to be the ones that eat that's where the name comes from and this is something i was passionate about so i was like i want to i want to teach these people but like i can't just start making nft videos right that's not, it wasn't something i wanted to teach you guys through transactional like fantasy videos that i do i wanted to get you guys into the space with a product that you were excited about so for a long time i was like man i can't think of i can't think of anything that we don't already do as a product like yeah we could sell the draft guide as an nft yeah we could have our subscriptions or memberships set up as nfts but that's fucking lame like that's what everybody in the space is doing and it's not a value add at that point you're just doing the nft part for the sake of doing it i'm like that's the last thing i want to do i want the nft part to be meaningful and have a reason 
for it being part of the project. So I was like, whatever we do NFT wise, it needs to be something that's brand new, something that's a complete new value add to our company, like a new product or service that we offer to our audience. And that was the, the mindset, the thinking behind the ideas that were churning away in my head. And I don't remember what exactly I was doing on this November morning, but it just popped. And I was like, yep, that's fucking it. We're gonna create a 1200 person fantasy league with our audience and we're gonna be the controllers of it. We're gonna choose how it works, we're gonna choose the settings, we're gonna choose the content behind it, we're gonna choose X, Y, everything from A to Z, we get to curate and handcraft it. Who's gonna be in the league? We only want cool ass motherfuckers that we actually associate with our brand and our audience members. And I was like, man, this is it right here. And of course I pulled inspiration from other people and brands that have done big fantasy things in the space, like Scott Fish, how Scott Fish Bowl, he's proven the need for a big fantasy football league, right? He has a, the, I think there's over 2,000 people this year. The fantasy footballers do the um, Megalobowl, Megalod, I forget what the name of their thing is, but they have another fantasy football league as well. That's like a free to enter thing where it's just, um, you know, you're competing in a big thing, but there's nothing, there, there's no huge incentive to it. Scott Fishbowl is obviously for a great cause, for charity, but at the end of the day, if you're a champion, you're just a champion. We wanted to make this shit like a real product where it's like, okay, we're competing against people in the fantasy space, we're competing against all the BDG members, but we're also competing for something fucking epic, right? And we made the grand prize, 10,000 shares of BDGE. Some people who have never followed us might hear that and say like, that's worth absolutely nothing. If you've been following me since I was at my mom's house recording YouTube videos eight years ago, 2015 was my first YouTube video, you might be like, fuck, this kid's on a trajectory for success. And I think his company's gonna have success. Therefore, I would like the option to get in on a private company, BDGE. We're not public, don't plan on going public. We'll probably never have the option to go public, but we'll be private. And you don't, you don't have the option to just invest in private companies. Like someone has to come to you and say, hey, I'm giving you the option to do so. So this is the only way that people outside of our employees in the company have the ability to own stock and have equity within our company. So I thought that was awesome. And I remember thinking of that idea and I had a ton of ideas from the start of how I wanted this project to go and got pushed back on like 90% of them because some of them weren't legal from like a tax standpoint. Some of them weren't this or that or just weren't like the norm for the industry. And most of that shit I tried to push back on, but like one for instance, actually I'll get into that later. But yeah, this was a very, uh, ambitious project i could say this was definitely the most ambitious project that we had that i'd ever put my crosshairs on and and really gone after so i thought of that in november of 2021 the mint day came in august of 2022 so that is a you know seven eight month span that we were working to make this project happen i don't think we did anything with it until i was just kind of throwing the idea around from like november december january while the other football season was still going on i started reaching out to people that i knew and trust in the industry some people that were knowledgeable in the nft space some people that were knowledgeable in the fantasy gaming space because with this type of project you have to consider things from a ton of different angles one consumer fit does my audience give a fuck about nfts do they give a fuck about playing with us how do we properly market to them the fact that this is going to be an NFT. How do we educate them on how to actually purchase it if they want to be in this? Legally, from a fantasy gaming, sports gaming, you can't just launch a paid fantasy football league that unless you have licenses in all these states and then it's only available to the to players and people in those specific states. And those are licenses that are impossible to get and really expensive. Then you have the NFT space. You have to make sure you're not selling it as a security, right? There are so many, and then giving away equity. Like there's so many different parts of this. This was a massive learning project for me. And I think there was, I can't look back on it and say that it was either good nor bad. Um, I don't think it's as black and white as that. We will get into things that I think were, that we did amazing. I think we did some things terribly, um, but that's why you improve. Originally we had this project slated to be a three year project, right? So you buy a bash pass, BDG three pass. And on the pass, it says your league number that you're in and the draft pick that you had. And it was a redraft style league where you redrafted every single year, but you'd have the same draft pick, you'd have the same league mates every single year. What the NFT allowed is for there to be a marketplace. So if you wanted to buy into Knicks league, you were allowed to do that. We had someone buy into league number one, which was a rare league, which had its own grand prize at the end of the regular season. So you have the ability to buy into any league you want and to buy any draft pick you want, right? And that's not something that's doable without the NFT aspect, without it being on the blockchain, without it being able to be purchased on OpenSea, which is the marketplace for NFTs. And that was the other thing, like these other leagues, 
which are free to play or for charity or all these things did not have any sort of marketplace availability to it. It was kind of just, you got what you got. And this added like a whole second dimension of what this project really was. And originally we had it slated again for three years. So people after doing the first year would start to think about, hmm, do I want to move to a different league in year two? Do I want to move to a different draft pick in year two, right? Do I want to buy multiple entries in in year two, et cetera? And there's a lot of cool secondary dynamics too, but we ended up going with one year because it was it felt a lot less risky after all the all the craziness that happened throughout the summer. So basically what happened was let's let's get into the learning. The uh, learning. I, I made like a list of, of notes here that I that I think I kind of came away with as a learning point. Uh number one, with any sort of innovation, you are going to get a ton of pushback, whether it's warranted or not. We got so much pushback on this project. Some of it was absolutely warranted. Some of it was, I completely disagree with it. It just, in my opinion, came from a lack of context or a lack of knowing what we as a brand are about. But again, this is something that I relate to like every fantasy creator. I get the question all the time. If I'm trying to break through in the space, what is something I need to focus on indefinitely? And one of my first answers always, outside of TikTok, is if you are trying to build a community, if you are trying to build an audience, the only thing you should be focusing on is your community. Like, fuck the fantasy community, fuck the fantasy industry, fuck fantasy Twitter, only focus on your community. You will never innovate if you are strictly focusing on what other people are doing. You have to focus on what feels right to you. And as soon as this project clicked into my head, I was like, yes, this is it, This we have, the project that I've been trying to have my brain pop out for the last five months. You have to go on what you are excited about and what you think will be awesome. And I think one of the, the problems that we ran into or I ran into personally was I think I got away from being focused on the community, which is extremely unlike focused on BDG's community, which is extremely unlike me. I think I just saw the vision of how successful I think this project could have been and still will be in the future. And I was like, man, I want to get this out to the world. And I don't think that's a problem, the way of thinking it, but it should always be focused on the people that are around you. And if it's good enough, it will make it out there at scale. Like the great J. Cole once said, fuck if you feel me, you ain't got a choice. Understood? Y'all are not hearing them. You're good enough internally. The external will start to notice everything and then they don't have a choice. And that's the best way to go about things. That's the best, most organic way to slide through. So with this project, it was never about making sure the fantasy industry or the fantasy community cared about the project. It was never an intention to uh, make sure the NFT community or industry took notice. Didn't give a fuck about those two. But with our marketing promotion, I, I let those thoughts kind of creep into my head for whatever reason. And when we made the promo video, which we could probably put up now, um, we had a lot of big names in the industry in the promo video because we thought that would help, you know, get our audience gassed up. Because there's a lot of overlap between my audience and like Matt Kelly's audience and Peter Overzet's audience and JJ Zacharyson's audience. So I was like, man, let's get everybody excited to play with everybody. You know, when I originally thought of making the project, I was like, this is just for our audience. Like I'm excited. If other people happen to trickle in, awesome. But like I'm building this for BDG fans. Like I want people that are excited to play with us, that are excited to play against me in a league, that are excited to play against Animal in a league, that are excited to play against One Chains in a league, that are excited to play against Ike or Tony or Sexy or whoever's been a part of it or Noah. Like everyone who's ever been associated with BDG was playing in the Big Dog Bash and got a BDG3 pass. So that's what I wanted everybody to be excited about. And for some reason, when I marketed it, I took it another direction. And that's fine, right? I think gimmicks and like tactic-y things have a time and place, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but I think that was one of the things I noticed that I've always had a grip on and it got away from me a little bit. But it goes back to the innovation. If you want to innovate, you have to do what you think is awesome, right? If you're not paying attention to the outside noises, the external innovation, then you'll have no grip on what you should or shouldn't be doing. You won't have a hesitation to do something because you're not focusing on what other people are telling you is wrong to do. Don't do that, you can't do this or whatever. There are a lot of parts of this project that I push for that everybody else is like, you can't do this, 
this isn't how you should be doing this. And I'm like, I don't care. This is like how I see it in my head. This is how we're going to do it. So with innovation, you're always going to have pushback, which leads me to point number two, lesson number two, is that as we scale, I need to be way more diligent about crossing all of our T's and dotting our I's. I think in my eyes, I still see myself as like, as, as the kid who made videos at his mom's house. Like, I think I'll always see myself as that person and always have that like, I don't really give a fuck who's watching or who's not watching or who wants to be involved or who doesn't want to be involved sort of mindset and attitude. And and as we scale and you know collect audiences that are bigger, that are far bigger than myself, um, we're close to 100K on YouTube, we're over 600K on TikTok, and I have a, a big email, like all of these new people that are just discovering us for the first time, they need to be introduced to our brand correctly. So I, I again, I just went into this project with a very like passionate, raw, edgy type of energy. Let's throw your people, if you wanna be part of this project, throw your fucking money in, start talking shit, and you know, let's get it going. I just wanted the competition, I wanted the energy of just the tournament to kind of take hold and, and run this project by itself. And with that came a lot of pushback. So if you were following the project at all, uh, there's this kid, Jake Tribby, who works for, I don't know if he still works for Fantasy Points or not, but he was working for this brand called Fantasy Points in the summer and wrote an article about the BG3 uh, launch, uh, an article about the Big Dog Bash, and basically went like point by point trying to eviscerate the project. Listen, I've said this before. I think 95% of the things in the article were relatively, uh, I don't want to say ignorant. I, th I think, I just don't think they held a lot of basis. He was arguing that like a DraftKings tournament, the, the rake percentage on a DraftKings tournament or a FanDuel tournament is so much lower than the Big Dog Bash. One, it made no sense because this was uh, this was a, a branding product, right? Like this, this was not about the rake. I think 95% of the people that entered the BG3 web space didn't do it because they were like, I can't wait to win first place in the fucking tournament and make sure I got my rake back or whatever. So the money thing was like, one, this is not a DFS tournament. Two, at the time, this was a three-year tournament. So there was way more value add as uh, being part of the content that we were doing, having the marketplace available to you, selling and buying NFTs if you wanted to. The project was much larger than just looking at it as a DFS rake play. Um, so I wholeheartedly disagreed with that point. Plus, we couldn't promise three years worth of you know, $80,000 worth of prizes before we had sold anything. Our audience is not NFT native whatsoever. So we had no idea what the demand for this project was going to be. We couldn't promise way more prizes than whatever the revenue was that we actually brought in. It, it, it was really just like the money part was, it was him standing in a Dell store, like a Dell laptop store and yelling at people that wanted to go get MacBooks because under the hood, their processing power was the same. People wanna go get MacBooks for double or three times the price because it's a value add to their life. You know, it integrates with the rest of their ecosystem and they like a MacBook better and it's smoother and they have certain apps that they like better. That's the comparison that I would give the pushback on that. It's it's a brand thing, right? If you guys have been fucking with us, you wanna be part of the experience in the tournament. It's, it's not about the money for 95% of the people that bought in, right? Again, I went into it with like a, yo, let's get 1200 people. And eventually we had to minimize that down to 600 people because of demand. This article put a lot of scrutiny onto our project. And there were a million people quote tweeting it, like a bunch of fucking ignorant people on Twitter that were like, I hope you got your lawyers ready. It was a bunch of like cornballs that get their entire validation from negativity and hoping that their negative tweet gets likes and stuff like that. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna bookmark all of these. We'll come back to it in five, 10 years and I'll hold that grudge, I guess, right? That's that's how we proceeded with this because there was just so much nonsense going on on Twitter at the time. But this, this opened up a few questions that we had to answer uh, better internally. One of them was the legality of the tournament which we had promoted originally as the Big Dog Bash. Like you are buying a pass to get into the tournament. Didn't think it would become an issue promoting it like that. Looking back on it after the article dropped and after a few different Twitter spaces, I thought more about the marketing and said, all right, we need to offer this as more than just this tournament. We, this needs to be an entire brand NFT. We need to go to go from the bash pass to a BG3 pass. We need to have a ton of other value props involved with it. The content creator workshop, all the content on the side of it covering the bash and covering BDG3 as a whole. We built the holders lounge in the office where people can come and visit us. We did some live events at tailgates. We flew out people from different parts of the country to come you know, watch the games with us, et cetera, et cetera. So there were a lot more value props once we thought about it. We said, hey, we're doing this holistically as a BDG3 project for you to get to meet us and get to know us better as a brand. And then we will have this tournament allowed within the BDG3 utilities. So you can join it if you want to, but it's a free to play fantasy football tournament that has prizes with it. 
So if you were a BG3 pass holder, you did not have to play in the tournament. So it was not buying a pass to play in the tournament. It was buying a BG3 pass to experience the value props of the NFT project. If you wanted to play in it, you could. The T's and the I's were not crossed to the level that it should have been given the scale of the project. And speaking of the scale of the project, uh, number three on this list, something of this magnitude needs to be looked at almost as entirely its own business, not a side project. Because you know a project brings in over $100,000 worth of revenue, that, that's a business for a lot of people. And we make more than that, obviously, as a business holistically outside of just this project. But thinking back on when I started, like if it, that would have been an entire business for me. And the way we looked at, or the way I looked at this project was was just that, you know, rather than a business, it can't simply be run effectively or to the level that we expect it to be from an hour long meeting each week or two hour long meetings each week. And from the money that we made, I think we had about five ETH left over, which is about $5,000 worth right now. Um, I mean, we gave away ETH prizes every single week. Uh, the regular season league winners, obviously the people who moved on in the bash, won a lot of money. We gave uh, away each week for random prizes, people who picked the best fantasy players on Thursday Night Football, for a ton of other shit. So we were left with about five ETH at the end of the day, uh, which is obviously not a lot, because we had to give 10% to the agency that we worked with. We gave around 50 BDG3 passes away to the influencers and the people that we wanted to play with, obviously some family, some friends, etc. So we had a little bit left over, and now we're doing like a playoff uh, DFS thing where we're giving away a few hundred dollars and some ETH and things like that. So we realistically will probably have like two ETH left over at the end of the project. So we made almost no money off this project, which is completely fine. I think going into it, I didn't think we were going to make money off of it. But one of the solutions that we need to come up with is, okay, if we're looking at, at this as a business, it's okay to have a 0% profit from it, but the investments need to go somewhat to people running the project. Because if we want this to hit the level that it can, like we need people dedicated to it. We can't just look at it as a side project and expect it to flush itself out as a main thing. Um, so for this new year, we'll likely need official people focused solely on BG3, like a project manager, a community manager inside the Discord, someone dedicated to just social media, filming and posting, you know, YouTube, Twitter, et cetera. And on that same note, the actual content for it. Now, when I came up with this idea, my thing was like, man, this is gonna be awesome because everybody in the office, everyone that's ever been involved with BGE is going to be taking part of it so we could just make content with all of these people. The problem was not everybody is a content creator, right? It was trying, it was like trying to fucking fit high heels on the shack. Sometimes it just ain't gonna work. And I didn't really, Again, this is a, a lack of crossing my T's. I didn't really think it through. I was just like, cool, everybody in the office is in it. Everybody can contribute and be a content creator. What we found out really quickly, you know, we, we made hour long podcasts weekly for the bash when the when the season first started. We stopped them after a month because our audience was like, I don't, you know, this is this is not good. We don't like this th these episodes. We don't like these weekly videos. So we were like, okay, we need to cut them. How do we supplement them? And I was like, we we're kind of like too deep into it already. So most of the content we ended up making ended up being within the Discord. So if you're within the Discord, we were making content that were related to the prizes and some of the bigger things that happened throughout the year. But the level of content that originally I wanted to have out following this tournament was uh, much lower than intended. It's, it's very, very, very difficult to keep 50 leagues engaged, 600 people, um, stay on top of all the storylines within all 50 leagues, when we all internally, you know, five guys in here, six guys in here, whatever, have our own, you know, five, ten fantasy leagues as well. Um, so again, it goes back to the fact that like this is not just something we can fix within an hour meeting each week. We need someone dedicated to making this project as cool as we think it can be still. Number four, the promo video we made for it is still one of the things I am like most proud of that we've ever done up to this day. Promo video was like a two and a half minute video that we ideated on, wrote the script for, filmed and edited for almost like a month to make a two and a half minute video. And again, going back to something I said earlier in the video, like I'm not someone who really believes in like tactic-y, gimmicky type shit. Like I do not like relying on those types of things to give you like a boost to take you to the next level. I think most of those are useless and most of those type of things that give you like a one-off hit, they don't last, they don't mean anything in the long run. It's like going into the, 
into it with a mindset of like, you know, this is going to be the home run for us. You're waiting, you have one pitch, you're being pitched and you're saying, I'm going to hit a home run for us. And there's a million things that can happen that aren't that home run. You could foul it off. You could fucking whiff on it. You could hit a single, a double, a triple. You can ground out flat, whatever the case may be. There's a million things you can do besides hit a home run. And if you are relying on those type of one-off viral tactic things that you need a home run for, that is just not projectable. It is not sustainable. It is not something that you want to rely on. However, this video in itself was something that absolutely skyrocketed and piqued the interest of everybody. So I think we will be doing more things like that going forward as a company. I never really wanted to put the time and effort into doing something that was two minutes long uh, over a month period. It just felt like that was a lot of resources that we put into something that was minute. Turns out I was wrong. It was not minute whatsoever. It was a huge part of the marketing for this entire project. So I will be looking more deeply into using high quality production type things to, you know, promote, uh, or show, you know, just show the documentation of the office or whatever the case may be. So that was cool. That was something that we did great. Number five on this list though, is going back to something I said before is I can't really look at this project as a success or a failure. Again, we did some things that were amazing and some things that were terrible for one, like the leadership on this project, me was terrible directing this, putting all these plans in place and then not putting the right people in place or not having the right things in place for those people to do. So they were a little bit directionless. The vision was always there. And it, that's something I'm, I'm typically very good at. It's one of my strong points, having a vision for projects or exciting things or innovative things and being able to see the big picture, you know, a year down the road, five years down the road, 10 years down the road, something I've always been very, very, very good at. Just seeing something in my mind and then making it come to real life. Like the fact that we pulled this project off was a massive dub. Finding a Web3 agency, getting the smart contracts done, pivoting when we needed to, going through all the criticism of that article, you know, getting the right consultants and lawyers involved, educating a completely non-NFT native audience on crypto, on how to purchase ETH. And that promo video we made was the single best promo video I've seen in the entire fantasy industry for a product ever in this space. So those are things we did great. We did a lot of things terrible. Again, like my leadership, putting the right people in the right places, keeping the entire discord and league engaged throughout. I just don't think we prepped enough. I don't think we prepared enough and thought of every possible outcome of, you know, if this doesn't work, what do we do for plan B and C? I think we were playing it by ear, which was a huge fucking mistake. The content falling short is another thing that we need to be on top of. Like I was I was running the BDG3 Twitter account, right? I'm the only one who ever posted from that Twitter account, which no offense is fucking ridiculous because I'm trying to run this company, but I never told anyone to do it, right? Like I never was like, hey, you got to take over this Twitter account. You got to post videos weekly or daily. You got to give updates on X, Y, or Z. So again, a lot of it goes back to me not feeling comfortable outsourcing things that are easily outsourceable. Everything goes back to the leadership on the project was subpar at best. Number six, uh, subpar engagement came from what I would summarize as people are pretty much going to be as excited about something to the level that they have skin in the game. So we gave away 50 free BG3 passes to influencers. That was a huge fucking mistake because again, I kind of went back to what I said as one of the first things in this video was we made this product for our audience and then for whatever reason cared more about people that weren't in our audience, people that we hoped could overlap with our audience, people that we hoped could help us promote and market this. And don't get me wrong, that promo video would not have hit the same without those 10 or 12 dudes in the middle where we have 50 cent in the fucking background with the music hitting. That shit made it awesome. But we didn't need that. If you were a BGE audience member, and you believe in our product and brand, then that little 12 second clip, 20 second clip, probably didn't make the difference for you. And while I liked having them in it, 90% of the dudes in there didn't give a shit about the project. And they had no incentive to, right? And I'm not sure what the reason for that was. Maybe it was because they got it for free and it was like, okay, like I don't have to, it's not my own skin in the game. Maybe it was because when the article dropped, there was some hesitancy behind the project and they were like, I kind of want to distance myself as much as they can, whatever, taking notes. But it more so felt like we had, I don't want to say like, cause some of them were engaged and some of them obviously participated. They all participated. They were all like setting their lineups and shit. So I don't want to take that away from them, but kind of felt like we had 50 computers in there, right? For all the free BG3 passes, I would say maybe like 30 of them probably acted as computers. And if we were to have switched 30 of those computers with 30 really engaged BDGE audience members, 
the project would have had a lot more energy to it. And listen, when I reached out to them and I was like, do you want to play in it? I'm going to give you a pass for free. I did that with zero expectations. I did not say like, you got to promote it. You got to talk about it. You got to tweet about it. You got to put it in your YouTube channel or your podcast or whatever. So they were free to do it, whatever they want. And I'm not complaining about it. I am just talking about the lessons that I learned and that having skin in the game obviously makes you a lot more passionate about whatever it is you have skin in the game for. That was probably number six. We got two more, I think. I'll wrap this up soon. Uh, number seven. I, I guess it's not really a learning curve, but I'm just I'm just proud that we were the first people to do this from a real like company brand perspective. What I mean by that, I mean the NFT. I mean a project that we can actually be proud of. We were, I mean we we're certainly not the first sports NFT, not by a long shot. We we're not the first football NFT. We we're not even the first fantasy football NFT. But I do feel like we were the first in that space, in the fantasy sports space, that had a built-in brand and audience and launched the NFT as a product that was a value add rather than just launching a product that had the word NFT attached to it and using that as your selling point. That's what 99% of projects in the NFT space did. They just launched something and said, oh, this is an NFT, like you have to buy it because it's an NFT, it's a new hot thing. And that's why 99% of projects in the space are worthless right now. They were all held up like a house of fucking cards. There was no real foundation, one small blow and they all come down. So I felt like we were the first ones that say like, hey, we have an audience, we have a brand, we have people behind us. We want to try to push the boundaries a little bit. We want to try to innovate and teach an audience of non NFT people how to get excited about this, how to physically purchase it, and hopefully open their eyes to what the technology is and hope, and, and then they can do whatever they want from that. They can buy other NFTs. They can, you know, do whatever they want. So I'm interested to see if I know the NFT space has an extremely negative connotation right now because of the way it's dipped off over the last like two years and into the recession. Um, but it will be back. There's no doubt in my fucking mind. So I'm interested to see if anyone tries to launch a project now. I would be surprised if they do because they can't make real money from it because the space is so down. But most brands would do a lot of good for their brand, even even if they did the exact same thing we did, but they made every pass absolutely free. They didn't make people purchase it. It'd be doing a lot of good for the brand. I can tell you that. Do a 100-person fantasy football league, NFTs attached to it, and then you always have that attachment with your audience. You can give them whatever you want. Or in three years when NFTs are hot again, and you want to relaunch it, and people will actually pay for it, you say, hey, only the people that had the original 100 or 300 or whatever are first in line to purchase it. So they have the ability to be the first ones to purchase it because you're attached to them via the blockchain already. So there are a lot of cool, creative, innovative techniques that will help people once the NFT space starts getting back into a more positive place. So I'm interested to see if over the next, you know, five, 10 years, who starts to try to do a project similar to what we did. And number eight, uh, not that I didn't know it coming into this project or it's something that I learned coming into this project, but man, you, you have, you have to fight for what you believe in always. You've got to be ready to fight to the death for what you believe in. And this project was almost at its death, but we were not about to let that happen. If we had come into this project with bad intentions, we would have let it die because it would have been just an expose piece of bad intentions. If you have bad intentions and you're caught, you have no choice but to either double down like an idiot and get into a worse situation or get out. But because we didn't go in with bad ex intentions, we just had to fight through all of the negative energy that was kind of around the project. And this is something I've learned the hard way since we've gotten into the, uh, into the office. Like as our YouTube channel again has grown up to nearly 100K as TikToks over half a million people, uh, as we launched this project to the masses, you will get more and more pushback from people. You know, the bigger your audience gets, the higher likelihood it is that there's going to be a select few people in that audience that have convincing arguments about why whatever you're doing is the wrong thing to do. But I would argue that any of those people that would attack you for doing what you believe in are just, one, just insecure with themselves. Two, have never been innovative at anything that they're doing. They just don't have the mindset to innovate. Everything seems fucking weird and crazy and stupid at first, until it isn't, until you real life it, and then it becomes a physical thing that you can imagine. Most people just don't have imagination, they don't have creativity, and then if they do, they don't have the work ethic and the drive and the passion to actually accomplish what you're going for. So as you grow, you'll get more pushback. But one thing I've learned really, really difficultly over the last six months or so is I care only about the opinions of people that I know personally. My family, my friends, my employees, and those of you that are hardcore fans of BDG, the people that are close to me. If someone knows me very well personally, and they can meet me, and we can be on video calls, or we can go out to dinner, or get drinks or coffee, 
And then after sitting down with me, you still walk away with something negative to say about me or negative to say about my intentions for a specific thing. Then I will take notice. Then I'm like, okay, someone can really sit down with me, know the real me, and then still say those things. There's probably something here that I need to listen to. But anything outside of that is not my concern because anything outside of that is just accumulation of people without context to entire situations. And that carries over to most things in life. Like anytime you start to hear outside noise, you're going to start to doubt yourself. But to me, that's just those people doubting themselves and they want to portray it onto you. When people get insecure about things, most people see their best course of action is to try and make other people insecure because then it drags them down right? Because they see a reflection of themselves. When someone's doing something innovative or someone's trying to do something successful, it's it's a subconscious reminder like, oh, you're not doing that. So you feel worse about it. You feel worse when you see other people doing successful things. So rather than try to do them yourself or try to pursue something or try to go after something that you feel really strongly about, it's much easier to try to drag people down. And it goes back to that Twitter shit. Most people don't want to put the work in to build something or give real value or, you know, get noticed for positive things. So it's much easier on Twitter to get noticed for negative things. So if you start contributing to the conversation negatively, there are going to be other people that jump onto that bandwagon because it's fucking hard to build something positive. It's hard to build something real. It's hard to build a foundation for something that people believe in and people are loyal to. Much easier to be negative. So when you see people being negative, understand it's just a lack of something internally from them. Um, and that's the way I look at, I mean, this, I've gotten away from BG3 at this point, but I'm just like, that's just the way my mindset has evolved over the last year or two years with so much noise coming at our company, at our brand, at the projects we do, at our social media accounts, at me personally. Um, as promised to Ike Baby, I try to keep this at 48 minutes. So um, those are the key lessons that I learned from this project, we very much intend to do uh, a year or two of the project. We, we intend to have this project go on fucking forever. I would like to do this every single summer. Every year, have you guys involved with the fantasy league that we are all in. We intend to relaunch it, but I have to get many, 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 many things in place. We need to have way more structure. We need to have way more direction. And that always starts with me. That starts up top. Because how the fuck... If I was the one who came up with this project, I saw the vision for it, how can anyone else know where to go with it? So for all y'all that were involved and had any negative feedback, criticism, whatever, feel free to drop it in the comments very publicly. I love feedback like that. And I take full responsibility if you had any sort of negative interaction with the project itself. Uh, we will take it as feedback and positive criticism to look at how we want to change the project going into next year. So, with that being said, this vlog needs to end because it's going on for a very, very long time. Uh, I love you. I hope you guys enjoyed this. We'll be back with another vlog next Wednesday.